Hello, my name is Dr. Jeffrey McRae, and I am the bassoon instructor at Colorado Mesa University. This lyrical etude in B minor will test your ability to play beautifully and smoothly. The key of B minor may not be a, a very familiar key for you, so I would recommend spending some time practicing the B melodic minor scale, as well as B minor's relative major scale, or D major. This will prepare you for some of the finger patterns you find in this etude. Take some time to get familiar with seeing and playing notes like G sharp and A sharp, which you probably see more often as A flat and B flat. You'll also notice some infrequently seen accidentals like E sharp, measures one and measure 14, B sharp in measures 14 and 15, and G double sharp, in measure 14. Take some time to figure out the enharmonic equivalence of each of these notes, and you'll very likely find that you already know how to play these notes. Note that the tempo is marked on Dante, and there is an additional expressive marking at the beginning, dolce, which means sweetly. This indication to play sweetly should be observed throughout the entire etude. In the context of this etude, I believe that the dolce marking also implies a sense of smoothness. Therefore, one of your goals in playing this etude should be to avoid any harsh or unintentionally accented notes. Considering some of the large descending leaps into the lowest range of the bassoon in this etude, striving to always play dolce may present some significant challenges. While it might be tempting to view this etude as being divided into two-bar and four-bar phrases, I would suggest interpreting this etude as existing in two eight-bar phrases, one long phrase in each repeated section, although you won't be taking the repeats for the audition. Obviously, there are rests in the first half that give us some clues regarding where to breathe, but I do not view the rests as conclusive evidence that a phrase has ended, nor do I believe that a new phrase begins after each rest. The eight-bar phrase structure is more obvious in the second half, and the composer gives us some specific places to breathe that, if executed well, don't have to interrupt the flow of the phrase. And that should be the goal when taking a breath in the second half of the etude. For this etude, I recommend that you take some time to consider the notes for which you will need to execute a properly sized half hole opening. In this case, these are the fourth line F sharp or F sharp three and the fourth space G sharp or G sharp three. You should note that the half hole opening for F sharp three will probably need to be larger than the opening for G sharp three. Also, always use the whisper key anytime you're using a half hole. I would encourage you to mark these notes. In addition, you must remember to close the half hole opening for any notes that don't need it. Likewise, you will need to consider which fingering you use for F sharp, particularly in the low octave and in the half hole range. If you are not familiar with using the pinky or the front F sharp, as opposed to the thumb or the back F sharp, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to learn to use the pinky F sharp. There are three instances in this etude, measures one, four, and 15, where you have an F sharp three that leaps to an A sharp, which of course is an enharmonic spelling of B flat. In order to free up your thumb for the A sharp, I recommend using the pinky F sharp fingering, otherwise your thumb would have to jump over the low E key to get from the F sharp key, the thumb F sharp key to the B flat key. While it's certainly possible to do this with practice, it's more difficult to do it cleanly than it is to just use the pinky F sharp. I do not recommend that you attempt to use the alternate B flat key with your ring finger as that will just cause more problems. For all of the other F sharps in this etude, you can use either fingering although I would probably use the thumb in many cases. If you are going to use different fingerings for the various F sharps, I highly recommend that you mark 
which fingering you will use for each F sharp. A simple way to do this is to write a T above the notes for which you will use the thumb F sharp and a P for the notes for which you will use the pinky F sharp. This is something that I frequently do in the music I prepare and it seems to work for my university students as well. As a general rule, I tend to use the thumb fingering in the low octave and the pinky fingering in the half hole octave, but this is due to intonation tendencies on my bassoon. As you are probably aware, no bassoon plays perfectly in tune by itself. So it can be incredibly helpful to test certain fingerings on your bassoon to determine which ones give you the best chance of at least being close. <laughs> From there, you can use your airspeed and the space inside your mouth and throat to make the necessary adjustments to individual notes. As you practice this etude, I recommend that you take some time to isolate and repeat the large leaps that go over the bar line from measure five to measure six, as well as from measure six to measure seven. Due to the dolce marking, you will need to learn to play these intervals as cleanly as possible while tonguing the low note as lightly and as legato as possible. Think a da syllable as opposed to a ta. I encourage you to practice slurring these intervals in isolation. <laughs> This will help you to discover what you need to do in terms of your airspeed as well as any possible changes to the size and shape of the inside of your mouth and throat to get the notes to speak cleanly. Remember that low notes on the bassoon often respond better with a slightly larger space inside the mouth, which I often think about in terms of vowel shapes. Think about shifting from ah to aw or from ah to o. Oh. When you've achieved consistency in slurring these intervals, then introduce a very light tongue on the lower note. Try to minimize the amount of time between these two notes, as leaving a musical gap here will disrupt the flow of the phrase. Keep your air pressure relatively constant and strive to do everything you can to avoid slamming into the low note which would interrupt the dolce character of this passage. I would observe the accented C-sharp in measure 11 and the sforzando C-sharp in measure 12, but I wouldn't make a giant event out of them. Consider the overall dolce context of the etude. If you've successfully sustained a sweet legato character up to this point, you shouldn't need a tremendous contrast here in order to honor the intent of the accent or the sforzando. Watch out for all of the accidentals in measure 14. Remember that accidentals carry all the way through the measure until they are canceled by the bar line. So you actually have three E sharps, two G double sharps, and A sharp and a B sharp to deal with in this measure. Take great care with the last measure. Low B is not the friendliest note on the bassoon, and it requires some skill and sensitivity to get it to speak softly with a dolce character. It also has a tendency to be very sharp, which will be very noticeable, especially since we're in the key of B minor. Increase the space inside your mouth and throat as you approach the low B, thinking ah or ah or o. Oh, and consider taking a little bit less reed in your mouth, kind of like you're rocking back a bit on the reed with your lips. This will frequently result in better control with the lowest notes on the bassoon. You also might consider a slight retard in the last bar. Uh.